Hello and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, the, I guess, last session of PyCon Today 2019. Um, we'll be kicking things off with lightning talk shortly. Um, oh, has everyone had a good conference? Um, does anyone have a thing that they learned or a thing that they're super excited about which they would like to say one sentence into the microphone about? Something you saw at a talk or I don't know, something you want to say thank you to a speaker for just like your talk was awesome. Uh, maybe think about it for a few minutes. There's a lot more going in the embedded Python space than I had any idea about. Uh, that was an amazing talk. Thank you very much. In the list of things I expected to see, yeah, the Mona Lisa talking was not one of them. <laughs> I'm trying to decide if what we're seeing on the screen is working or not working. Uh, hands up if you had trouble with uh, the video setup during the conference. <laughs> um, we've been uh, experimenting with our own kind of hardware this year. Adam's going to say a little bit more about that during the, the closing keynotes. Um, cool. Uh, Ron, shout when you're ready to go. I'm not there. Can you mirror? Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other suggestions? Oh, yay! Awesome. Cool. So we have quite a few lightning talks to uh, get through. Um, so hopefully. Um, well, people will definitely keep to time because we all remember uh, two-finger clapping followed by uproarious applause, uh, watch me for the sign, um, and hopefully there won't be too many uh, video hiccups. So up first, we have uh, Ruan Zaron speaking about Starlet and UVCorn ASG framework. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Ruan Zaron. I work for Xmente. And I'm quite excited to tell you something about this uh, really cool little web framework in Python called Starlet. So I say little, maybe you think now it's insignificant or not powerful, but uh, maybe you can learn something today. So let's say you work for a business and you have this really clever idea of an API that you want to create. Um, but you've never done it before, you don't have a lot of experience, and you ask yourself, what would be the quickest way to just get started, to go from my idea to actually implementing something? So you would probably head to the internet and see while there are quite a few to choose from. Um, and this is not even close to all of them. And then you maybe end up feeling a bit like poor old Homer here. So um, at Xmente, we really value putting a lot of effort into researching uh, the technologies and frameworks that we use. So I would like to tell you a bit about uh, Starlet and Uvicorn, uh, because you might think that since it's open source and it's free, you can't go wrong, but uh, somewhere down the line you will pay some kind of price. So just quickly, Uvicorn is the uh, ASCII server where the A stands for asynchronous. So you get all of the wonderful uh, asynchronous capabilities of Python right there in your lap. And something cool is you can use uh, WebSockets directly. And it's lightning fast, according to them. I'll get back to that. Then Starlet will be the ASCII framework, but it's extremely lightweight. You can decide to just use it as a toolkit if you are already in some kind of ASCII server. It has no hard dependencies. Um, you, it has a nice class to directly work with WebSocket uh, endpoints. And just a cool thing I wanted to add is that you can work with GraphQL queries, which is quite a natural way of uh, querying databases. And as according to them, serious 
seriously impressive performance. I'll get back to that. Just a quick example, um, if you are already using some kind of um, ASCII server, which is usually there's some kind of asynchronous callable um, that you send, scope, receive, and send, and if you decide to only use a small portion of Starlet, uh, like there it's using the plain text response, then that's all you use. Or you can use the entire Starlet uh, framework to do everything for you, to handle all of the work. So there you can see there's nothing special about that code, in, but it's simple. It got me started, and where it says return JSON response, there you can go mad. Your imagination is the limit there, and it's very lightweight. So why do we like it so much? Well, it's easy to learn, and that means it's quick to learn. It's intuitive. Uh, communication is very important for developers because we communicate with our code and it just improves the communication if it's intuitive. It's lightweight, so you don't have trouble with dependencies most of the time and the breeze to deploy. And they say it's high performance, but let's get back to that. Um, it's modular, so it um, forces you to think about components and reusability. And the documentation is really well written. Um, I think you don't have to be a Python expert to understand the document. So even the beginners can actually start um, to create a web API. And if you look at their Git repository, the development is quite active. Um, if you want some further information, there's, you can just Google it as well, the Starlet and Uvicorn. Um, you can get quite uh, all of the information you would need to get started, and the examples are, are really well written. So um, they say now it's so performant. I think that's a bit braggy of them, and um, I would say the proof is in the pudding. So where's the pudding? If you go look at Tech Empower, you can see the um, uh, some web frameworks that they uh, tested against each other. So you can see uh, Uvicorn and Starlet, black sheep creeping in there because it's in Cython. But um, actually you can see there that is, it is quite competitive and something worth considering when you want to create a very simple API. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Ron. If the next person could come uh, start getting set up. Cool. So following on from, from yesterday, um, just while I'll give Loris a few moments to set up, uh, hands up, who knows what a lightning talk is? <laughs> hmm, somehow some of you still don't have your hands up. <laughs> um, oh. Things are up on the screen. Cool. Um, well, up next, we have Loris talking about the almost unlimited power of probabilistic data structures. Take yeah. us away. A bit of a mouthful, yeah, I know. Uh, OK, hi, everyone. I'm Loris. Uh, I'm from Italy. I'm a developer advocate at Redis Labs. So the date is April 25th, 2018. I'm in San Francisco. I'm at RedisConf. This is my first time in the United States, and I'm there because I'm a speaker. This is also my first time speaking publicly. Uh, it's 15 minutes before my session uh, has to start, and I noticed that I lost my passport. But I'm not worried because I think I know where I dropped it. Search for it, I don't find it. Now I'm worried. I go to the front desk. I ask the front desk if anybody has turned the passport in, and they say that nobody did. So now I start panicking. But the clock is ticking and I go on stage and do my presentation. This is my presentation. Um, if you watch it, you can hear my voice that I'm a bit distressed. Um, but it's, I do it anyway. So the, the topic of my talk is probability data structures. I wrote a module for Redis that implements one. And at the time, I wasn't working for Redis Labs. I was just a, a software engineer doing consultancy. Um, the reason why I was doing that is because I was consultancy for a Singaporean fine and tech startup uh, that was doing something fairly clever. They were um, doing a reward system where you sign up with your credit card with them, and then what, whatever purchase you make, you get points, cashback, this kind of stuff. But they're not a credit card company. But they do struck a deal with credit card processing um, 
credit card processors nationwide. So they basically have this system where you swipe your card at the merchant, the transaction goes through, reaches the national credit card processor, and there a piece of software written by me checks the credit card number, and if it's one of our customers, we award the points. Um, I'm talking with the CTO, and I'm asking, them, and I'm asking him uh, how many credit cards do we need to store? And he nonchalantly says, 500 million, oh, sorry, 600 million. And, and I'm like, okay. Um, to be precise, I don't see the credit card numbers. I see a SHA-512 base 64 encoded, which is much bigger, it's like 88 bytes. And that would take between 50 and 60 gigabytes to store 600 million of those things. It's doable, it's not bad, but we can do better. Uh, publicity data structures, there are Bloom filters and Cuckoo filters, uh, which is what I implemented. They can bring down these six, almost 60 gigabytes down to 500 megabytes. How can they do it? A very clever way of basically fingerprinting each number. So you don't even store the full number, you only store some bits of the original number. The catch is that, of course, you, get a, uh, you cannot retrieve uh, the original value because you don't have it, but you can still answer questions like, is this credit card number in my set or not? Or is this element in my set or not? The catch is... Um
<laughs> so there's about 290 people here now, and we're all interested in rare events. Christmas, winning the lotto, and of course, birthday cake. So what's the probability of you getting birthday cake today? Well, Alex, thank you. Somebody far smarter me than me has worked it out. And let's see how improbable this gathering is today. So if it's your birthday, can you stand up? Anybody? Do we have only, only one? <laughs> okay. And yeah, terrific. <laughs> I don't know if we want to do a little happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And now returning to our usual lightning talk schedule. Okay, cool. we'll take his laptop. Um, we're actually just hit four, um, which is meant to be the end of our lightning talk. So, um, Pietras, are you around somewhere? I just want to. Are you okay with us starting your talk a few minutes late, um, just so we can finish the rest of the lightning talks? Resolution. Good. Um. Hey. Oh, wow. First time. Now the question is, oh, I can see slides appearing. Good. Uh, up next, we have VUC there um, talking to us about how to send desktop notifications from the shell and Python scripts. Um, and if you're ready to go, take it away. Okay. As you can see, title has changed because of some last minute changes I made to the talk. <laughs> so my name is Vuisile, I'm from Zimbabwe, and I'm a tutorial writer at a website called realpython.com. So my talk today is about how to add GUI features to command line scripts without actually making the command line script a full blown GUI app. So why would you want to do that? Firstly, you have better use of your time than watching scripts running uh, in the terminal, right? You may, want, you may be running a, something like an update or a build or compile. You want to leave that running in the background and get a notification when it's done. Or maybe you want your application to interact with the user. You could have the user type into the terminal, but wouldn't it be easier if we could just use GUI elements to allow your users to interact with your application? So that's what I'm talking to you about today. Uh, two utilities that are found in Ubuntu and similar operating systems. So the first one is Notify Send. This is a handy utility for sending no notifications to the user from the command line. Now, if you've used a program like VLC, Spotify, or Slack, you've seen the sort of pop-up notifications I'm referring to. You, you, it's possible to send the very same notifications using Notify Send. And the way you do that is you call notify send with a bunch of options. Uh, so you give it a, the message, a title, and a body. If you want to add icons, you could do that. So let's suppose you are making a weather application, right? You'd need an icon to represent the type of weather you have that day, and uh, a title, and the, the actual weather. If you are writing this uh, in Python, you could use the subprocess module to call the notify send system program. And that would look like that. And it would generate a pop-up that looks like this, right? Now, it's possible to take this a step further. If you want to add GUI utilities, you use a program called Zenity. It allows you to add these little widgets to your scripts, like forms, date pickers, etc. So here's a file folder selection dialog box, for instance. Now, if you have a script or a command line application, that requires a file path from your user. user. It might be difficult for your user to type in a full file path in the command line, but it to be easier to use a file selection dialog box. Zenity will display this to your user and return a string representation of the path to your script. And it can do custom forms, like if you wanted to do a, a date picker or something like that. Right. So if you'd like to know more about these two utilities, you can go to the 
Usenity documentation page. I also wrote a blog on my own website on how to use uh, Notify Send. Thank you very much. Cool. So I think that was a, a new record for best lightning talk time. Three minutes, six seconds. <laughs> Extra round of applause. <laughs> so since we're, we're running um, a little bit over, over time, my challenge to the remaining two lightning talk speakers is, can you better that? <laughs> um, so one of the, um, oh. Yay, screen. I don't have to say something. I can save it for later. Um, are you ready to go? Cool. Uh, next up, we have Chetan uh, Katri speaking to us about deep learning for text processing. Hi, everyone. I'm Chetan. So I'll talk about uh, deep learning for text processing. So the problem is that uh, you, we have got data for veterinary uh, products and medicines, and data contains the uh, product description and product. So by getting all the product description from the social media, from everywhere, that which medicines called what, and based on that, uh, has to figure it out that this description of the specific um, medicines belongs to this category. So I'm using um, pandas and numpy to import the data. And in CSV file, I got two columns, description and the product. So the problem is to classify this description belongs to this product. And from the data, I'm just removing drop duplicate for duplicate data, and then figuring out shape, and converting that to NumPy array, and then uh, saying that which is x and y to train the model. And then I'm sp uh, splitting the data with 60% and 40 percentage and uh, Zendum st uh, state for 42. So um, as you know, that it shouldn't get uh, uh, gradient uh, uh, overfitted or uh, underfitted. So that um, then I'm first trying with uh, scikit-learn feature extraction text and saying count vectorizer to do data processing. And then I'm using uh, term frequency, inverse uh, data frequency uh, model TF-IDF. And then I'm uh, using new bias um, to figure it out which belongs to what. And getting pipeline and using uh, multiple algorithm together to run the pipeline in, in, in terms of uh, ensemble uh, combination. And then as you can see, um, in this I'm getting 85% of accuracy. And since I did uh, random um, sampling, so it shouldn't uh, be in the same part of the data. Then to test that, I also tried uh, SGD classifier. And the same way, um, I create the pipeline and provide the iteration and the penalty rate for uh, function. And, uh, and trying the uh, same, mod uh, same way of fitting the model and doing prediction. And I can see here 87 percentage. Um, then I tried grid search uh, on the same thing and used the n gram range for TF, IDF, and CF alpha. This is the uh, rate for that. And then I'm trying to fit the model and score the um, inference. It's saying 68 percentage. And then I'm checking with my uh, available data whether it is correct or not. And I can see that uh, this. Uh, description of this specific veterinary medicines belongs to what it is this, for example. And then uh, I thought, why not I can try with NLTK and see that, uh, uh, which is uh, helping me here. So I tried with uh, Stamer and the way it is provided with you. And it's giving me points, 60% uh, accuracy. And then I went to the TensorFlow and deep learning based uh, approach where I can, I mean, I just imported TensorFlow and then same way of removing drop duplicate and creating test and 80% uh, uh, and 20% uh, here and providing random state. So it's not the split is from the same uh, sort of data, but it's, it's uh, suffered altogether. And then I'm using Keras um, tokenizer 
and transforming encoders to um, preprocessing part and creating categorical with uh, float 32 and then checking the uh, safe here. So here, if you can see, I'm using Keras deep learning, uh, Keras on top of the uh, TensorFlow, uh, creating sequential model, and then uh, using activation ZLU and dropout rate to kill some of the neurons which is not working out, and using a softmax classifier, and um, loss function categorical cross entropy and optimizer Adam, and then uh, training that. And uh, I'm getting function here, which takes the features and uh, label and shuffle that. So I can iterate the function on top of the data set here. So same function I'm iterating here. This is part of estimator API and training that. And after training, I'm doing evolution, means inference of that. And then um, I'm again uh, doing that. How can I automate and do prediction on top of the data? And uh, I'm trying to see and compare the um, the actual value, y and y hat, means the one which was actual and one which was predicted. And um, yeah, so I can see all correct here. This is producing 98% on uh, data set. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, so, I'm not sure if you noticed, um, kind of right there at the end, um, just like PyCon ZA, the right at optimizer to use is Adam. Um, thank you, Adam, for um, running an amazing conference and, um, yeah, I'm doing a ton of work behind the scenes um, to kind of wrangle the rest of the organizing committee um, and kind of make a lot of things happen. Yes, um, yes, Chetan's talk went kind of right down to the wire, so the time for Laura to beat is still uh, three minutes, six seconds. And Laura's going to be talking to us about the PSF Scientific Python grants. Uh, so this is more of an announcement than a lightning talk, so I'm going to win for sure. Um, so the PSF is the Python Software Foundation, and they're sort of like the Python mothership. Um, they own the intellectual rights to Python, and they also do a whole lot of stuff around advancing Python and advancing, broadening, shall we say, the use of Python. So amongst the things that they do there is provide funding to projects that are broadening the use of Python. And one of those groups that it gives funding to is um, the Scientific Python Working Group, who then disseminate it to scientific Python projects. Um, and the type of project that we fund are workshops and conferences, um, education type things, so outreaches um, and other educational projects. And most recently, we've also started funding uh, developer meetings um, or sprints. And what that could look like is something like uh, a bunch of developers or scientists get together to um, maybe uh, work towards a uh, visualization package in Python for geology or a bioinformatics package or something like that. So if you are working in any of those spaces and you have ideas or you have plans that could do with some funding, um, funding is available. And how you apply to it is that you go to that site, python.org slash psf slash grants. And if you want a bit of background information about the kind of projects we've funded in the past and um, the exact mandate of the working group, you can go and have a look at that second link. And when you do the application, just say that it's Python, um, scientific Python related. And also come speak to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Cool, thank you, Laura. And that was one minute, oh, 44. one minute 48. Cool. Um, and for it's going to be, it's going to be a, a tough bar, I think, to beat, one minute 48. Um, um, in case it wasn't entirely clear from Laura's lightning talk, she's actually one of the people on the, uh, um, on the scientific uh, Python grants uh, committee. So when you submit your funding application, it will go to Laura. <laughs> um, so it would be nice to her if you want to be funded.
Um, awesome. Uh, and as well, the last lightning talk, um, if I can say 2019, we have um, four Omfego speaking to us about not using the Arduino SDK with our devices. Okay, so uh, my name is Mpo. I work for SKA. And uh, when I submitted the talk, I titled it Stop Using Arduino for ESP Devices, but I uh, decided uh, the more suitable title would be Why You Should Stop Using Arduino SDK. <laughs> So uh, this is going to be a very short, uh, well, to make, to make a long story short, we moved offices from Pinelands to uh, Observatory, to a very open, play, open plan uh, type of office. And uh, since the number of, we don't have enough number of windows, the idea was to get plants. <laughs> and because, for obvious reasons, apparently plants give us uh, oxygen. So <laughs> over time, uh, I got bored of uh, watering the plants. So I decided to hook up um, ESP8266 and a pump. And um, that, that would be my uh, automatic uh, watering irrigation system. So oh, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> no one really cares. <laughs> so, the reason why I uh, decided to use Python, well, we are a Python community. It's uh, very scalable, and pretty much all the information is on my GitHub page. So obviously, yeah, stop using Arduino, use MicroPython. Unfortunately, with ESP8266, uh, second Python was deprecated in 2007, uh, 2017, so MicroPython all the way. Um, so a bit about the automatic um, watering plant. So it sends um, Slack messages when uh, the plant needs watering and an automatic uh, pump hits in for a couple of seconds. Also, who doesn't like graphs? It's, it was a good idea to add some graphs and yeah, that's about it. Um, I also noticed that a couple of speakers got uh, ESP32s I mean, I was also hoping that also lightning talk speakers would get one so I can play with it. But that's, yeah, that's another. So I, I created a library cookie cutter uh, for MicroPython. So if you're really interested in diving into MicroPython in ESPs, you're welcome to clone it and use it. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, since you asked, you can come get an ESP32 from me afterwards. 